Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. So it's been kind of a chunk in between um, my last video and this one. It has been a crazy, crazy week and a lot of good things have come out of it. Lots of stress, but I hope I can share that with you guys soon. And in the meantime, I was going back and forth on what topic to do. I thought maybe I'd take a break from the true crime um, because I have been doing research into cases, but there's still a few pieces that are missing in this last kind of case that I'm looking into that is another more group discussion one. So I thought I'd fill it in with this topic because a lot of people have been asking questions about it and kind of my experience through it, and that is self-medicating. And for those who are new, welcome, <laughs> I'm Jess. Um, I went through a very abusive relationship from the age of 14 to about 19, 20 when I fully got out of it. And, um, there are still, um, communications on my abuses parts and that's kind of going to link into this video a little bit. But, um, yeah, I... There was a lot of demons that I was dealing with at the time of all of this abuse. Um, you know, I I was told by a lot of people in my life that it was all in my head. That nobody was going to believe me. That this was an impossible situation that could happen. That I had to get along with my abusers. That it was my fault that I was asking for the abuse that came along with uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse. And apparently it was all my fault. It was all in my head. I was asking for it. And this was told by adults in my life. And I, I honestly, I didn't know where to turn. Um, you know, my parents did the best that they could with me. Um, you know, they were very back and forth with the whole situation because for a long time, the school, because sadly, this did take place during my high school years, you know, they were told different things from the school that it was my fault, that I was a, I was a bad student, I was, you know, misbehaving and all this stuff. And eventually, um, you know, my parents didn't know exactly what to believe. You know, I was kind of covering up the whole situation. I, I wasn't exactly lying to my parents. I just wasn't telling them the whole truth. And, you know, they just didn't know what to believe from me. Um, it was a very complex situation that, you know... My parents did the best they could with trying to support me. And again, I didn't tell them everything and I still haven't to this day um, just because I felt such shame because I was raised in a family that, you know, believed in strong females that, you know, told me that I, you know, that I was strong and beautiful and, you know, what to look for in a, you know, for an abusive relationship and not to get myself into those situations. And, you know, I did Taekwondo as a kid and I felt all of this shame. And, you know, being told that this was all in my head or, you know, that I was asking for it, 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 it really weighed on me that I just I didn't know how to handle my feelings and process any of this because I wasn't given the chance and you know as a kid my parents introduced alcohol as like not this they didn't hide it you know they drank you know at family gatherings but it wasn't like you know 20 glasses of wine it was an occasional glass of wine and an occasional beer they didn't try to hide it so you know we when we were, we asked questions about it like oh what are you drinking and stuff and they would explain it to us they didn't hide it from us so like i wasn't that like curious about it because you know it's like okay it's alcohol you know only when you're an uh, adult not a kid's drink type of thing like it wasn't like this big mystery thing to me um so you know kids uh, young adults, they do tend to um, sneak 
alcohol and that is what my abusers tended to do on um, really bad days for them and you know they would offer it to me and it was a way to numb myself you know this again not fucking healthy at all guys um, but it was a way to numb everything that I was going through I didn't want to feel it I didn't want to process anything because I was I didn't know how to I wasn't giving those tools to process it so drinking the alcohol that they gave me kind of numbed everything and that is sometimes how I got through the daily abuse and I you know Again, I was young, you know, our, our brains aren't fully developed um, and our just impulses aren't fully, fully processed. So that was like, you know, there was a lot going on and, you know, it wasn't something I was proud of. I hid that too. Um, unfortunately... <laughs> My dumbass, um, this actually wasn't my, well, okay. So there was this, I, I talked about this in the last, um, a few videos ago. So a friend of mine was, um, she had alcohol in her bag and, you know, we kind of took a few sips. It was alcohol. It was apple alcohol, vodka. And we took a few shots of that. And then she's like, oh shit, like, you know my parents are gonna check my shit. I'm like, okay, whatever, I'll hold on to you. It wasn't like that thing, that big of a deal. But unfortunately she poofed and vanished and moved away. It was, she gave it to me on a Friday and she like moved away. It was very sudden on a weekend, kind of sketchy, but whatever. So I stuck with this alcohol. And I would literally stare at it daily. I'm like, you know what, why not? You know, like, I just want to be numb. Um, I didn't take it. My parents found it. It was a whole thing. I literally downed it down the sink because I didn't like really give a shit. Um, my mom found it one day when she was just putting away or looking for something and she found it. It was it was this whole big thing. It, it turned out to be a big fight. I dumped it down the sink. That was, you know, and of course that was another sketchy situation where I was like, well, I'm holding it for a friend. That does sound sketchy. And of course, you know, my parents were like, you're bullshitting. How the hell did you get this alcohol? Um, so, you know, trust issues <laughs> were not, um, yeah, they were, they, they were big. Um, and, you know, after I got out of high school and, you know, I was suppressing all of this emotions and what I went through. And it wasn't until I was 21, um, where kind of my world came crashing down and what I mean was um that was kind of like the year that I was like yeah, I don't, I'm ready to face my bullshit um you know and ask for help because you know anxiety and depression was starting to take over and you know I was popped on some medication and I thought oh hey everything is rainbows and butterflies you know yeah um and you know I was relatively starting to feel okay but um again my world came crashing down and my aunt uh passed away from stage four pancreatic cancer and it literally felt like the rug was pulled out from underneath me and i couldn't breathe and i didn't know what to do because everybody around me was grieving and i just didn't know what to do i had to be there for everybody you know that that was like i felt like i had to do that i had to support everybody my uncles my my dad my mom my brother i had to be there supporting everybody you know what fuck my my emotions i had to be there supporting everybody that didn't turn out so well for me because lo and behold my ex contacted me one of my abusers, yes, there were six abusers. For those who are new to my channel, there were six. And my ex ended up being one of them. And he contacted me out of the blue because 
from a friend of a friend that I had on Facebook sprinkled that down the pipeline to him that my aunt passed away and he lo and behold wanted to reach out because hey he still loved me I was his world I was everything to him but he had a girlfriend guess how well that turned out um again I was not in a good emotional um place in my mind and you know he was reaching out and contacting me and he's like you know we have to talk in secret and because I have a girlfriend red flag right there red flag and I was like I, I you know in my gut I was like this is this is fucked up just he did this to you years ago he still hasn't changed so I did not contact him. Then he contacts me again a few weeks later. By the way, my girlfriend is pregnant, but I don't love her. Mm-hmm. I love you. Another red fucking red flag. It's like, yo, bitch, leave me the fuck alone, right? And at this time, I was still processing everything that, you know, happened with my aunt. And then every goddamn emotion came flooding back for me from high school. I, it, it, I literally went on a, like, I, everything, everything hit me like a ton of bricks. Every emotion, every, like, memory I tried to bury of what they put me through came flooding back. And it was the most painful thing I had to deal with. Um, because A, it, it, I was not prepared to deal with it at that time. And lo and behold, I turned to alcohol. I got in contact with this old school mate of mine that was pretty chill. He was, he was okay. And FYI, guys, I, I know this is going to make me sound slutty. But I grew up with guys. My class was all guys. I was the only female in my class. So I grew up as one of the guys. So I get along better with guys, not in a sexual way, but I'm like one of the bros. Um, I just feel comfortable hanging out with guys. Again, nothing sexual, but we can just talk about sports, abortion, like anything boyish. I'm, I'm fuck, hello, I'm here for it. <laughs> Cause I'm used to that. Like it's not, I don't know, females I'm okay with. Like I can, you know, have girlfriends and all that stuff, but I just, which is weird because I know that I was abused by six guys and, you know, I, I do have trust issues with dudes, but I just do feel more comfortable in, like, hanging out with the bros instead of the lady bros. Hmm? Okay. Complexity. I know. Anyways, so my old schoolmate was a alcoholic and is, but he is in recovery as far as I know. I don't know. Don't really talk anymore. Anyways, so yes, I hooked up with him, not in a sexual way, um, but yeah, he became my drinking buddy, and that was an interesting experience. You know, you know, I was 21, I could go to the bars and drink, and, you know, we would just sit for hours and drink and talk, and, um, and it was mostly in the evening, and of course, you know, I would... I was really good at hiding it, guys. I'm not. I'm not gonna fucking lie. Um, I, uh, you know, I would just come home and act normal. Um, and you know, then scatter off to my room because I was a homebody. I was, you know, still living with my parents at the time, and I, I just stuck to my room. Like I didn't want to be around anybody because I was still suppressing everything. And I think my turning point was this was a solid six months of drinking relatively heavily and I think my turning point was um one day I uh met up with my friend at the bar he was in a really bad place he lost a friend so I went to go you know be supportive and I ended up day drinking and when I got home I was like yo girl that's that's bad that is seriously bad when you start day drinking and this was a weekday and luckily I was 
on spring break or whatever for my college at the time like yeah I was literally drinking for six months but I managed to keep a really really high um school average I fuck I don't know how I did it but I did it sweet baby Jesus I did it and um you know, I kept a 4.0 average and I was like, I'm here for it, <laughs> but I was drinking. But yeah, when I turned to day drinking, I realized that I was really just suppressing everything, that I just did it because I didn't want to feel anything. I wanted to feel numb. I just wanted to shut off all my feelings, all my emotions, everything. And it, it, it got pretty bad when my best friend, <laughs> had to pick me up from the bar and I was so smashed <laughs> so smashed that um uh, I ended up calling him Captain B yes let's introduce you to my best friend Captain B um I've talked about him in other videos but uh yes that is a journey we have known each other since we were younglings like five and um yes I was so so smashed that um he literally had to drive me around until i was fucking sober enough to go home um and funny enough um that night i i don't know something like i was just disappointed in myself because at this point it was a few days later after my day drinking experience and um I was just honestly disappointed and devastated in myself. I was like, I don't know this person I've become type of thing. And I remember I was driving around and, you know, and he's trying to sober me up. He had to pull over on the side of the road a few times so I could pee. That's how bad it was. Um, yeah, why don't we just pull this all out? Like, right? Um, and I remember processing in my head I, as he was driving around and um, I just remember being like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. You know, like what the hell is wrong with me? You know, I am suppressing all of these emotions. Why? Because, you know, my aunt died and I miss her and I just don't know where to turn to. She was the one person, you know, I confided in and she was the one person I talked to about my experience that got me onto the road of, you know, what I was on before she was, she died. You know, I was starting to feel good and, you know, she would be disappointed in how I fell apart. Like, hello. And I just remember turning to my best friend and being like, hey, hey, Captain B, I need to tell you some shit. And I didn't tell him everything that night, but I I told him enough um, of what happened in my high school year. And I remember just apologizing, dumping this on his lap. And like, I was crying, I was I was a mess, you know, I was, I was numb. And, and I told him, I just, I don't want to feel like this anymore, you know? And it, that, from that point on, I knew I had to get my shit together, that I just couldn't, I didn't want to be this person that was just so dependent on being numb and just being, not being able to have a life you know, a good, healthy life, because I didn't thought, think I deserved it. And, you know, it took me a few days from talking to my Captain B um, to really sit down and just get clear-headed. And I just remember saying, okay, you know what, these meds that I'm on, First of all, not a good thing to mix those meds with alcohol. Second of all, I don't think they were working. They were making me, even before I was drinking, um, they just weren't doing anything. They were making me more, you know, having more anxiety, more depression. Like, it just wasn't good. And then, you know, I threw the alcohol on it and that kind of just numbed everything and honky-dory. 
not really. So I was like, okay, you know what? I need to get on better medication. I need to better myself. And it was the most scariest experience of my life coming to terms with everything on my own. You know, I got good medication that was able to allow me to start processing everything that I went through beginning in high school. And that took courage to sit down, look myself in the mirror, because I hate looking myself in the mirror. I just didn't like what I saw. It still makes me uncomfortable looking myself in the mirror sometimes. And I had to have this serious conversation with myself of being like, what you went through was real. Everything that happened, the good, the bad, the terrible, happened. No more hiding, no more shutting down. You need to start processing this. And it took me a while to slowly start to process everything. I, you know, I, I wrote. And how I wrote was not just a journal, but a story of a random character that I created and a random scenario. And in it, I started processing and writing what I went through through this character and how easy it was to write it on paper and kind of look back at it and be like, holy shit, girl, you went through some shit. And I did that for a while. And I started writing different stories and incorporating that my story into this story. And then I decided, okay, you know what? I'm still hiding. I'm still hiding behind this character that I created. So let's get real, Jess. Yes, this is a conversation I had with myself and I wrote a book. Haven't published it to this day because it costs a lot of fucking money, but you know, eventually I will get there one day and publish it. And I wrote it. And this was really, really an emotional time because I was working full time at the time. And it just was so emotionally draining to just literally get it all out there on paper. Well, I typed it, but you get the drift. And I closed it off. I wrote it, I closed it off, and I sat on it for a few weeks. Because I was just so emotionally drained. And then I went back, started editing, and editing it. I just started, you know, going through it and spell checking. And yes, I fucked up on that word, but that's okay. <laughs> Brain's going a mile a minute. Um, and I printed it off. I put it in a binder and I read it to my best friend, Captain B. Hey. Um, and I know he was emotionally fucked up from it because, I mean, he was there during the time and he felt bad because he didn't see kind of the red flags. He knew I was sad, but he didn't know to the degree. And that kind of made me sad because I'm like, hey, you're not supposed to feel sad. Like, it's okay. Like, I'm okay type of thing. And for the first time I was saying, I'm okay. I'm okay. And it, I, it, it felt really good. And I'm not saying that this is going to be everybody's journey through self-medicating. Um, this is just my experience with it. It's, it was scary to be that numb and to turn to that numbness. And again, I'm not saying this is how everybody processes just shit. This was just my journey. Everybody deals with shit in their own way. And to be so free of that numbness was beyond scary. I didn't, I didn't know what my two legs were to stand on. I had no clue, no clue whatsoever. And that was fucking scary. But once I started processing things and, you know, dealing with things, I realized in my life that I wasn't doing things for me. I was doing things to please people. Um, 
and that stems from my abuse okay I, I I I admit that like that's that's totally a thing um I just wanted to make everybody feel better you know um do what made them happy so they wouldn't be mad at me type of thing and that was emotionally draining on me and eventually when I came to the realization of this I made some really really holy crap life-changing experiences um I left a job that I thought at the time you know I was doing it for me but I wasn't doing it for me I was doing it for my family because they said I needed to get out there in the world and find a job and was putting all this pressure on myself and you know still dealing with everything or not dealing with everything and you know I left that job and I didn't have a job for almost a year until I found my job that I absolutely fucking loved and then COVID hit good times that I was off work for a year and um then they called me back and then I got sick and kind of this red tape bullshit and kind of true colors of my work situation kind of came out and it, you know it, it absolutely devastated me of like you know I want to work but you guys are doing this whole bullshit thing and not even being supportive in a situation of fucking COVID and a pandemic and you know I decided that I had to make some life changes for myself again um and I'm taking this leap of doing this terrifying experience and I am learning a lot more about myself um, and about the people around me, you know, who I can really count on, who I can't, who I might have outgrown. And that saddens me because there's some really good people in my life that, you know, I really have to start to question, you know, can they be fully in this experience with me or are they just a friend type of thing, you know, to have and chat and hang out or do they really want to be in this with me? And for the first time going through kind of like this new experience, feeling it all and not, you know, closing off or whatever, it has been a really scary and terrifying and amazing experience. And again, everybody has to find their path. You know, I mean, doesn't have to, but they do eventually, hopefully. And yes, it will take some time and some work and blood, sweat and tears. I should you not. I am still putting in to this day. But to get to that point in your life where you're like, hey, I can fucking do this. Um, and feel comfortable with yourself and proud and, you know, just go forth on your dreams. It It's... It is scary, you know, but to get to that comfortable point in your life where you want to get uncomfortable again, it's it's an experience. And guys, I'm not saying you guys have to go out there and do your shit today. It takes time. And, you know, whatever your path is, it's different from mine. I know that. And, you know, if these videos can relate to anybody or kind of just be like, hey, you know, I went through something similar or like, oh, wow, that's your experience. Can I show my experience with you? You know, I really want to build this community up and the good and the bad. And as you can see, my crazy ass has been through a lot and it has done some dumb shit. But hey, that's all a part of life. Anyways, guys, thank you for staying with me on this journey and through this long ass video. I appreciate it, guys. Remember, never give up. Always keep fighting. You're enough. And you're very much loved. Until the next video, guys, stay safe. Love you.